I guess that means recording. Uh, so welcome um, to Google Analytics 4 Tips and Tricks for Drupal 9 and 10. Also, I suppose, Drupal 8 if you're still in that situation. Um, kind of what we'll go over, a little bit of an intro, who am I, who are y'all. Um, gonna hit Google Analytics 4 in like five minutes, super fast. Um, talk about how you get GA4 on Drupal basically, and then talk about a few gaps that we've run into uh, with GA4. Not all of them are Drupal specific, but some of them are. Um, and some of them, there are a lot of cases where I haven't found like great documentation for how to do this stuff, so I figured it'd be helpful for folks. And then uh, close it out, and then probably go get some beers, I think, seems likely. All right, uh, so as an intro, who am I? Uh, I'm Steven. Uh, I'm an account manager at Design Hammer. We're a, um, a full service uh, strategy design development firm in Durham, North Carolina. Um, we work a lot in Drupal, though it's not the only thing we do. Um, I've been working in Google Analytics for over a decade, I oversee most of our uh, analytics implementations. Uh, so, who do we have here? Um, uh, who here is a dev? Yeah, a little bit. Uh, who here does some PM stuff? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, so, who is a freelance? All right. Agency. All right. In house. Cool. All right. Uh, so, just holding up fingers. How would you rate your comfort or experience with Google Analytics? One through five. Five being top. Are you asking about Google Analytics four specifically, or um, either? Let's let's do Universal Analytics first. Uh, okay, I got a four for Universal Analytics. Three. 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 All right. Uh, and GA four. How would you rate your experience? Five being the top. One, and I'm not going to show you which finger I'm like. Ah, I hear you. I hear you. All right. Uh, has anyone installed GA4 on a website? Yeah. Some? Okay. Uh, and does anyone use Google Tag Manager? All right. Some people. Cool. Um, so let's level set a little bit. Uh, I am not a developer. Um, if you couldn't figure it out from my title and what I said already. <laughs> so. Um, it's quite possible that you say, hey, technical Drupal question. I'll go, hey, that's a great question. And uh, I will not be able to answer that fully. So I'll, I'll, I'll let you know what I can answer and what I can't. Um, I'll be showing you ways that we have successfully addressed some gaps in GA4. Um, but uh, there are other ways to do things. Um, I'm going to assume you've got some level of familiarity with Google Analytics and Drupal. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and assume that you've got a GA4 property already and it potentially installed on a Drupal site because I'm not going to cover a whole lot of the details there. Uh, but let's start with GA4 in five minutes. Clock starts now. All right. Um, so what is Google Analytics? Free service offered by Google for web analytics implemented through JavaScript on website pages. Um, it's kind of an evolution of Urchin on Demand, um, first released in 2005. Uh, it's gone through several versions. GA4 is the most recent, came out in 2020. Um, last year, when I pulled that stat, um, almost 86% of websites were using either Universal Analytics or GA4. So it is like the market leader. Um, Universal Analytics, uh, we might colloquially call GA3. It was released in 2012, over a decade old. Um, it, it was really just a kind of a refinement of the old technology. Um, basically, upgrades between previous versions of analytics were pretty painless. Um, and uh, stopped tracking last week. Uh, so uh, if you uh, didn't know that, not tracking any more data anymore, so that's an important thing. Um, Google's only committed to providing that data through December of this year. Maybe they'll extend it. I, my guess is they probably will uh, because uh, Analytics 360, the paid universal analytics service, has more runway, so I don't think they're gonna shut it off necessarily, but it's unknown. 
So, yeah. Anyone that's not Google tells you a thing. Yeah. Could you elaborate a little bit, if it's not too much to ask, about the the reasons for stopping tracking and what what the political context is and, and what what does Google Google give up or what does Google gain in, in the proposition of stopping tracking? Uh, so the question is, why is Google stopping tracking? Yeah. Um, they haven't really said that I've seen. Uh, basically, I think that they, uh, my opinion, purely my opinion, is one, they don't want to support two different platforms. Uh, and they've actually been shutting off a lot of stuff. So like, uh, you can't recover a Universal Analytics account anymore if you've lost admin access to it. They basically, the web form is broken to do that stuff. Um, so I think they don't want to, I don't, they don't think, they don't want to have two different platforms they're supporting. Um, UA has been uh, uh, basically determined to violate GDPR, so you can't use it in Europe. Um, and there, I would expect at some point in the future, with a lot of the state level privacy stuff that's coming online in, in the US, it's going to become problematic. It would be prob problematic in the US as well. Uh, GA4 is better for that, not perfect. Um, so I think it's probably a combo of those two. Um, and I mean, the third thing, and I've got a slide for this later on, is uh, basically, you know, if you're not paying for a service, you are the service. So, you know, unless you're we're paying for Analytics 360, you weren't paying for it, you were providing data. And so Google's like, well, you want a free thing? Here's the new free thing. We're turning off the old free thing. So, I mean, it's unfortunate, but that's kind of the way that it is. So, right there's a slide. Um, you know, because the thing is, they can cut you off from years and years of analytics data, but if you're not paying for the service, you are the service. I am the service. Um, and also, the big takeaway, if you had sites that were using UA and GA4 is not in place, you are no longer tracking data. So, Important, maybe you've got something to do tonight, I don't know. Um, GA4, initial release in 2020, entirely new model for tracking and analysis. Uh, it's just, it's different, incompatible with earlier models, um, and there's no import. Um, that said, I don't think it's actually that huge of a deal, honestly. Um, I think the need for like five or six or seven year old analytics data is in the real world, pretty useless, right? I mean, who cares? You mostly want to say, what, what was last quarter, what was last year? And so you can export data from Universal Analytics and reports into CSV, mess around with Excel if you want. Uh, but I think a year from now, probably not a big deal. Um, so one of the big things that's different about GA4 versus Universal Analytics is kind of at its core, it's about engagement. Um, so they have a bunch of different metrics. So analytics, Universal Analytics, you're probably familiar with like average pages per session, average um, session duration, bounce rate, huge thing. Everyone hates bounces. Um, G4 is more around engaged sessions, average engagement time, and engagement rate. And they've got kind of this new concept of engagement. So um, that's important. We'll talk about engagement in a second. Um, uh, everything, uh, so in Universal Analytics, you had page views, and then you had other events that you could configure. Um, and that was like usually pretty useful stuff, like did someone download a file? Was a web form submitted? Because at its core, um, Universal Analytics was just, the page has been viewed, here's the path, and blah, blah, blah. Um, and events were kind of this add-on thing. In GA4, it's events all the way down, right? Uh, and it's got um, several uh, what they call enhanced measurement events that are just kind of turned on by default. Um, so scroll, video engagement events, so video star, video pause, video progress, file downloads, off-site link clicks, all that sort of stuff. They also have a whole library of what they call our recommended events, which are effectively recipes for different events that you can configure. 
Um, you don't have to use those. You can make your own, you know, whatever you kind of want for your data. Uh, but one of the recommendations is using recommended events if you've got a, um, a use case that lines up with one of those because the conjecture is at some point in the future, Google might leverage some of the patterns in the recommended events. So you might as well be tracking the data in that pattern so that you can take care of, take advantage of that potential new whatever it is. Um, goals and conversions are different. Um, Universal Analytics had four types of goals. Um, so uh, a pages per session goal, a time per session goal, uh, an event goal, and then uh, like a funnel goal. Get to this page by going through these previous pages. G4 has one type of conversion that it lines up with. This event is a conversion. There's none of that other stuff, no funnels or any stuff like that. You can, you can kind of, using audiences um, and stuff like that, you can sort of retrofit some of the older style goals, but it's a little hacky. Um, reporting. Universal Analytics had over 100 reports. A lot of them were broken, didn't give you useful information anymore. GA4 uh, has 20 predefined reports. Um, they focus on engagement, stuff like that. Uh, custom reporting is a bit more visible. Um, there's, there's this explorations view in, um, in uh, GA4 that lets you do a bunch of stuff. And a lot of the, the predefined reports are customizable. You can add and remove cards, kind of tailor that to what you'd like. Um, and then a lot of people use Looker Studio, still the dumbest name of Google product. Data <laughs> Studio made a lot more sense. But is this a good or a bad thing? Kind of depends on your point of view. I mean, on the one hand, a lot of times working with clients, there are 100 reports, they get lost, don't actually get any answers. And you know, analytics becomes overwhelming, so that's not great. Um, a lot of the UA reports aren't supported by some of GA4's data and privacy models. Um, the GA4 reports are more easily customizable, so that's kind of nice. Um, and explorations are a lot more robust, in my opinion, than um, the custom reporting in Universal Analytics still kind of terrible from a UI perspective. It's really confusing. Um, but a lot of people kind of institutionally have been reporting on bounce rate for like 20 years, 15, right? And so there are a lot of the suits who are like, but what's the bounce rate? What are, how, how are my pages per session, blah, 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 right? So there's a lot of pain in that sort of transition to that's not calculated anymore. And honestly, that model is kind of old. That made sense when it was, we want to sell ads. And how, many, how many ad impressions are we doing? That's really what UA was about. Um, Other kind of minutia stuff. Um, properties. So in UA, you'd have a property and you might have multiple views. You'd use different filters to kind of um, exclude external traffic and be able to kind of drill down a bit. Um, now, there's no views, it's just a property. Um, and you can actually kind of, um, the GA4 property will support multiple data streams. So you can actually collect data from multiple sources, uh, say a website and an app, and actually look at a holistic user journey between those two. Um, you can, uh, we're actually gonna do, you can collect data sources from multiple parts of a website uh, and get them kind of collated, so that's actually kind of nice. Um, if you need this sort of view stuff that you used to do with filters in UA, um, the uh, audience and segmentation system for GA4 is where you need to do that sort of stuff. Um, I think I actually skipped over uh, in kind of what engagement means. I think it was on the earlier slide. Engagement GA4 is session that's over 10 seconds that um, involves uh, more than one page view or has one of the engagement events that happens. So video engagement, file download, offsite link click, those sorts of things. Um, so basically, once one of those criteria apply, then that session's considered engaged. Um, you might say 10 seconds, that's not very long for engagement on a website. 
true. Um, that's something you can configure in GA4. Um, all right, basic GA4 for Drupal. How do you get it on there? A um, bunch of different ways of doing it. Uh, a lot of it, and there's no, I think, right or wrong answer here. Um, so it sort of depends on your own particular context. Um, when you create a property, um, G4 actually includes step-by-step -step guidance for a lot of popular platforms, including Drupal. Um, uh, you know, there are two Drupal modules that are out there that are, you know, will allow you to drop in your stream ID or IDs in some cases. Um, there's the Google Analytics module, been around for a while. Uh, and there's also the Google Tag module. Um, the instructions provided by GA are for the Google Analytics module. Be like, here's how you install a module. It's animated and stuff like that. Um, Google Tag module, though, is actually uh, supports both Google Tag Manager and Google Analytics 4, as well as a few other uh, services. Um, Google services supports multiple tags. Um, it's actually uh, developed by Google and Acquia, probably the one to use going forward. Um, you can also drop your tracking code in manually, just like you might into your template files. Um, and you can also use a tag manager like Google Tag Manager. I think I summarized that. Um, one important thing if you're using the Google Analytics module, particularly if you have Drupal 7 sites, um, you're going to probably need to upgrade or patch the module in order for it to support GA4 because a lot of the older versions only support UA and won't work. Um, other things, I, I'm not a huge fan of the Google, Google Analytics module because it's kind of opinionated about adding custom events um, and I don't like its opinions. Um, Google Tag Module. I had not played around with this before putting the slides together. Seems actually pretty nice. Um, supports a variety of tag, uh, variety of Google tags. Um, it allows you to turn on a bunch of the recommended GA4 events, which is kind of cool, so you don't actually have to set those up another way. Um, it allows you to set custom dimensions and metrics. We'll talk a little bit about what those are a little later. Um, it allows you to basically uh, include um, uh, include your uh, tracking code on certain content types or certain user roles. So it gives you some granularity there. Like if you need to have, you know, one set of tags that's for anonymous users, another one for your logged in users, all that sort of stuff. So you've got some some good flexibility on a per tag basis there. Um, and like I said, supported by Google and Acquia. So if you're going to use a module, this is probably one to do it. Um, Google Tag Manager. Um, if you're going to implement uh, via Google Tag Manager, you don't need to have your Google Analytics 4 data or your Google Analytics 4 code and your GTM code separate. You can do all the GA4 stuff within GTM, and it's a little cleaner. Um, I think if you have them separate, it's really easy to end up with double tracking situations, which is no fun <laughs> because once that data is in there, it's in there. It's kind of a mess. Um, so for Google Tag Manager, if you want to add that to Drupal, um, there is the Google Tag Manager module as well as the Google Tag module. Um, the Google Tag module, again, we talked about, that's the probably the best one going forward. Google Tag Manager module, um, frankly, we've run into some permissions issues using that. Sometimes it's a little wonky, so I'd, again, use Google Tag, uh, or you could put it directly in a template. Our devs prefer directly in a template because they want to have control. Um, all right, so GA4 does a lot out of the box, but there's still some gaps. So we'll talk about some of those gaps now. So um, let's talk about four gaps that we've run into. Um, one is useful web form submission tracking. Another is embedded YouTube tracking. Third is actually improved scroll depth tracking. And fourth is um, scalable GA4 management of multiple websites, including multi-sites. Um, so contact form submission tracking. Um, so there are enhanced measurement events out of the box for form start and form submit, which track appropriate web form interactions. So you get a lot of data out of the box. But 
all of these use the HTML ID, like uh, HTML form ID. Um, so if you've ever looked at what your web forms render as with form ID, it's not great if you have more than one web form. <laughs> now, particularly if you've, you know, used blocks to drop web forms on different pages and you would like to have some form of reporting that's actually useful about what pages are actually generating contact form submissions, that sort of stuff, it's a mess. Um, so an example from one of our client websites, form ID that can be submitted via the uh, form submit event is web form submission long contact form node six add form. So, I mean, you could figure it out, but it's probably not super helpful. Um, oh, uh, we're gonna be using Google Tag Manager to do a lot of this stuff. You don't have to. Um, you could do this with JavaScript yourself. You could probably use the Google Tag Manager to get a lot of this stuff done too. Um, I usually work in GTM. It allows me to take screenshots. That's why I did GTM here. Um, so uh, what we're gonna do is say, okay, we're gonna use a recommended event. We're gonna use a generate lead recommended event. Um, and then we're going to use a Google Tag Manager lookup table to match up web form IDs with human readable stuff and submit that human readable form ID with the generate lead event. Um, again, kind of looping back, the generate lead is a recommended event, so it's best practice to use recommended events. It's for a form submission that generates a lead. It is the recommended event if you've got someone submitting a contact form. Um, so we'll basically create a generate lead event using a GA4 event tag, but we need to do a few things first. Uh, so the first thing to think about when you look at a generate lead event, it basically doesn't, it has like a value associated with it. So if you want to track like the, like from a marketing perspective, the value of the event for a conversion, but it doesn't actually have a parameter for the form ID. Conveniently, that's easy to add, but that's what we'll need to do is have a form ID that we actually submit to GA4, um, and, but we'll need to actually do a couple of things to get there. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're going to enable GTM's built-in form ID data layer variable. Um, so that's basically um, allows you to expose the form ID to GTM so you can interact with it. Then we'll configure a GTM lookup table to map specific form IDs to, or a form ID pattern to useful names for reporting. Um, you, can, you may need to kind of monkey around with GTM's preview mode or, um, or inspect element uh, to track down the specific patterns for your website. Um, but once we do that, we'll, we'll be able to use the lookup table to populate the parameter on the event. So I've got some screenshots here. So in uh, GTM, if you go to variables, there's a section that says configure, a whole bunch of built-in variables. You wanna make sure form ID is turned on. Then uh, you can also create a new custom variable. You wanna select lookup table, or in this case, a regex table. Um, because since we've got, in this example, uh, we have basically three contact forms, um, but they are using blocks and paragraphs put on different pages. The form IDs follow a particular pattern, so we use regex to uh, sort that out. Uh, so basically, what's happening here is if uh, the input variable is the form ID that we've just enabled, so when, a, um, so when this lookup table is consulted, whatever form ID is available to GTM, it says, look for this pattern, output this name. All right, so now we've got that lookup table now we can make an event in GTM for the GA4 event. Uh, so we'll create a, a GA4 event tag um, and select um, your GA4 config tag, which basically says what data stream you're using. Um, and then we'll name the event generate lead, we'll add a parameter for form ID, and we'll select our lookup table to populate the parameter. Um, and then we'll set a trigger for some uh, form submissions. Basically, got to think about that trigger because we don't want just any form submission because if you have search form on your website, depending on how you have views implemented, those might be 
technically forms. So you want to make sure that you've got some exclusions in place for your own website to not get a whole bunch of generate lead events that not, are not actually the web forms that you're concerned about. Uh, then you save the, trigger, save the trigger and tag and test using preview mode, then publish. So what's that look like? So you create a tag, uh, you select the GA4 event tag, put the name in, for generate lead. And again, we're, we're calling it generate lead because that's the recommended event. It's not required. Um, put your parameter name, form ID, and then um, you'll be able to uh, select, um, this is a little Lego block thing, you can select and pick your uh, available variables or you can type it in. Double curly brace is how you target a variable in GTM. And then you create your trigger um, on form submissions, but not all form submissions, some form submissions. And here are two exclusions that avoid the different uh, searches that are present on this website. Make sure that's set up for your site. Then once you've got that tracking, now you're sending those custom events, or the, the, you're sending that event to GA4, but there's one more step. Um, so, uh, my, Potentially two more steps. Uh, one point, you might want to mark the generate lead event as a conversion in GA4. You might say, hey, if we had contact form submission, that's a thing we want to be able to segment as a conversion. So you probably want to do that, not required. Since we have a custom parameter on our event, we also need to register a custom dimension or metric, in this case, dimension. Um, so basically, that's in the admin. Um, and we'll, I'll get screenshots for it. As a note, about 24 hours after you've got this saved is when you'll start to see data populating. Um, it just takes time. Uh, so basically, uh, once you get to the admin, you can create a custom dimension. Uh, so your dimension name, that is what is going to uh, be accessible for you in GA4. Your scope for this is an event, it's coming over an event should put a readable description that you will remember what this is at a later point. And then your event parameter needs to exactly match the parameter name that you sent over from GTM. So that's how that's added. Um, we'll pause now. Any questions on that so far? Make enough sense? Cool. Uh, so embedded YouTube tracking. This is actually the thing that got me thinking about doing this talk because I ran into this and I said, said, this is insane, it's really annoying, and I can't believe no one's actually written something about this. So, um, if you are adding embedded YouTube videos and other embedded media uh, via the media module, which is the way you should do this <laughs> in Drupal, um, um, and then they use the oEmbed lazy load, in many circumstances, there may be some circumstances that are not, but in many circumstances, these embedded media, this embedded media is not visible to either GA4 or GTM code in the appropriate place for that. Um, so basically, you do not get any of your video, your, any of your enhanced uh, measurement video engagement events the way it's default configured, right? You put your uh, embedded media in there, and it's just, there's no, I don't know if it's no scope, but basically, G4 and GTM can't see the interactions. Um, there is, this is mentioned somewhat in the OEmbed lazy load documentation, uh, which includes a workaround, right, for injecting your GTM container code into um, a particular twig template. But we can't simply do that, because if we do that, if we inject the same code there, we're gonna start double counting page view events, right? So, and we could potentially double count other stuff. It's not great. So basically what we'll need to do is we'll need to create a second data stream, which we can do. We talked about that for parameter, or uh, for properties. Um, and so the way that we've been doing it is basically make a video engagement only data stream in your property. And then that's what you can use going forward. So basically go add a new data stream, fill out the info, and you're gonna turn off every enhanced measurement that you can except for video engagement. 
So if you're in your admin of GA4, you create add a stream, call it whatever you want. And then under uh, tag configurations, there's a little gear where it says enhanced measurement. You can toggle off basically everything except for your video engagement. So once you've got that, um, since I'm using GTM, you need to create a, your own container there because there's not going to be a great way for the single GTM container to determine where it is um, to say which data stream. So that's why you have a second GTM container for your second, for your data stream, uh, for your video data stream. Um, and so basically, all you need in that container is just a GA4 config tag, because that turns on all of your available enhanced measurement events. So it's, that's a pretty vanilla container. And you just have that trigger on all pages. Um, and once you've created that, you need to add that container to that appropriate template. Um, and uh, this is an instance where using the module, I don't think there's a way to do it. I think you actually have to add this to the, the template code. Um, uh, and then special note here, just way GTM works. Um, you actually have to publish the, um, the GTM container before you test this, because if you've just created a GTM container and you try to preview it, it won't populate any data. Just helpful hint. So how can you tell if it's working? So when you go into preview mode, if you go to a page that has embedded media, you'll see two instances of the tag assistant. This is the main GTM container, and this is the one that is in the twig template. So you can actually see both of these. And then, from your preview area, you can actually switch between the available Google tags that it can reference in the preview mode. So we've got, in this case, two GTM uh, tags, and then we have within those two GA4 tags. And so that's how you can actually track what's, what's processing there. Um, once you configure that's firing appropriately, depending on how your other videos are embedded, you might want to disable your enhanced measurement video events uh, from your main um, GA4 data stream. You don't have to. I don't think there's a way it can double count, but it might, you might want that for cleanliness. Um, but if you have, say, other videos that are not implemented via the media module, not embedded via the media module, you don't want to disable it because you'll have, then you'll miss those video engagements. All right, any questions about that one? I think that one's actually kind of handy because it shows different data streams and the enhanced measurement stuff, yeah. So is GA then smart enough to pair those two things together? Yeah, well, so what, it, what, what it's going to do is... A video, like, I can go back in time now, okay, this person who watched the video all the way to the end, they came from the next website. Yeah, that's the reason you get the two data streams is so that it's, you know, it can basically say, okay, this is the same session, right? right? Because that's, that's the whole point of having the multiple data streams is to be able to track someone going between an app and a website or multiple different websites. Or in this case, two different parts of the same website. Cool. All right, improved scroll depth tracking. So um, one of the enhanced measurement events uh, that GA4 does out of the box is scroll. Cool, right? Um, but... The enhanced measurement events are really there not for the reporting on the enhanced measurement um, and what they're talking about. They're there to power the engagement um, concept that GA4 is measuring, right? Right. So they, they are events that are that basically you know will allow a session to qualify as an engaged session. So you know you might have sites a uh, site with a very long page and maybe you've got like a huge a uh, huge footer for whatever reason on your site the scroll event um, only um, only fires the enhanced measurement one only fires once you get to 90 percent page depth um, so if you have to answer the question of like how many people get to 50 percent page depth how many people get to 75 percent page depth it doesn't help uh, but 
uh, we can uh, basically extend these enhanced measurement events, just like we've extended a recommended event. So that's what we're going to do for the school event. Um, so first thing we'll need to do is, again, I'm using GTM, not the only way you do it. We're going to, uh, we're going to enable another GTM variable, school depth threshold. Um, then we'll create a GA4 event tag uh, called scroll. It needs to be scroll exactly because that's the name of the um, enhanced measurement event. And then we'll create a trigger with uh, different vertical depths. I just said 25, 50, 75, and 90. Um, so it's not typically helpful to set the trigger for 100 since that would actually have someone get all the way to the bottom of the page um, because normally people don't do that. Um, and that's kind of what we're going to do. Now, a quick note here, as I've had the question of, like, what if um, it's not a long page and someone just loads the page and they actually are at 90% of the page visible on load? It's not actually on actual scroll. It's just page visibility. It's just called scroll. Uh, so if 50 or 75% of the page is visible on load, the event will fire. Uh, so again, we go to variables, we add scroll depth threshold, um, we create our event, we name it scroll so it exactly matches the enhanced measurement event, um, we add a parameter for percent scrolled, and then we drop the, the uh, built-in variable for scroll depth threshold in, and then we create a trigger on scroll depth for vertical scroll depth percentage. And we put our percents in there. Um, once you've done that, you know we have a new uh, parameter we'd like to see in GA4, so we're going to need to register that. Um, we can test it. Uh, so we're going to need to register that, and also we want to turn off the enhanced measurement event in um, in GA4 because we don't want double scrolls happening, right? Particularly at 90%, that seems wasteful. Um, but once you've got that uh, disabled, you can publish the container. Uh, and since it's since you've turned off the event named scroll and you create a new event named scroll, it's still going to react the right way for an engagement perspective. It's just a little more broad criteria, and you have more data to report on. Um, and I don't want to forget to register your custom dimension for the percent scroll. So custom dimension, same sort of thing here. You got to see the same pattern. We just got to make sure that our event parameter exactly matches what we've got coming over from GTM. All right, pause. Any questions on that? All right, uh, so scalable GA4 management. So um, you're probably starting to get the feeling here that like there's a lot you can do, and GA4 is pretty cool, but it's a lot of stuff on a kind of a per site basis. And so if you're going to be doing this over and over and over again, maybe you don't want to have to do this for every site, right? <laughs> no, I certainly don't. <laughs> um, so uh, you know, if you've got kind of a common pattern that you're using, Maybe you want to reuse that over and over again. Or let's say you've got a multi-site that has a lot of very similar things. And you know, your, your web forms are going to be very similar across the multi-site. You know, your video is going to be very similar across the multi-site. So you might want to be in that situation of like, I don't want to have to do this 20, 30, 80 times, right? Save some time. Um, so we can actually uh, use sort of the fact that the stream ID is a little bit modular. Um, and uh, use a lookup table to basically use a single GTM container that, um, based off of the host name that it's loaded on, knows which stream ID to pop into the GA4 config tag and therefore fire all of your events. So the big thing we have to do is make sure that page host name, the built-in GTM page host name variable is configured. Um, and then we're going to create a lookup table that we've already seen a lookup table before uh, that's fed by page host name um, with the input being the complete host name uh, and then the corresponding GA4 stream IDs. Uh, and then a, a note, make sure you include the whole host name, however it resolves. Don't leave off triple W if that is what 
those name is because it will not work. Um, if you need to account for some variability, you can either use a regex table or you can have um, uh, multiple instances with the same uh, uh, data stream ID. It's not, the lookup table is not super smart, it just goes down the table until it finds one that matches and then it goes, so it's not, not rocket science. Um, and then basically once this is completed, you substitute lookup table in your GA4 config tag for just putting your GA4 stream ID in. Um, and that way, whenever the tag fires, which is generally all pages, it'll say, what's my host name? Cool. The lookup table will then populate the appropriate stream ID in GA4. You're off to the races. So what does it look like? Uh, lookup table, page host name. And this, this is actually from one of our multi-sites, um, which is, uh, has like 20 some different sites. And there's a dev instance and uh, uh, like there's three instances in this because of where this is in development. But the basic idea is you put your host name in, you put your output uh, stream ID. And then when you go over to your GA4 config tag, you drop in uh, the, the lookup table variable name and that's really all you need to do for that. Um, and you can, you, I've, you can like chain all of these different uh, sort of gaps together. We've done all of this on that multi-site, for example. Um, so, come about on time, yeah. Uh, so, conclusion, um, Drupal's a pretty good platform, right? We are all here because it's very useful in a lot of cases. GA4, significant evolution of UA but limited out of the box, so you need to kind of do a little extra work to uh, make sure you're actually tracking stuff, particularly in Drupal. Again, that embedded media thing, I was really annoyed when I found that out. Um, but, you know, I hope these tips and tricks will help out for y'all. So that is all I've got. Any questions? <laughs> Yeah. Do you, does a lookup table like that have to be defined inside of Google Tag Manager, or could you use an external source for a lookup? I think you can do all this with external as well. Um, the big thing that you'll need to do if you want to interact with it in, in this, um, we're skirting right up the edge of as much as I can speak to, but my understanding is, um, is with external code, you can populate stuff to the data layer that GTM has access to, and so you could do that from an external source if you wanted to. Okay. I could not, but you could. One, one of the things we do, I, I can't remember exactly what it's called, but in Google Analytics 360, mm -hmm. we have a, when an event hits a certain level, mm -hmm. I think it's page views, it sends us an email at the end of the day saying, this page was viewed more than, or X number of times. Mm -hmm. It's reported, it's like an email reporting. Does GA4 do that? Do uh, that? Or, I think there is a... Are you talking about in Google Analytics 360? Yeah, um, I have a lot of experience with 360, but I know there is some sort of, uh, there's like an intelligence right. thing that I think can do some of that. I, yeah, I've not not done that personally. Um, the other thing I think you could do is with audiences and segments, mm -hmm. you could configure, um, because basically the way the audiences and segments work is you, you define a series of conditions and then you can trigger an event when someone, when one, a session or a user meets those conditions and then they get added to the audience or segment. So there's probably a few different ways to do that. But I probably have a report, which would show. Yeah, that. yeah, and then you could use that report um, and just look at. Dashboard. Yeah. Gotcha. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's more of a GA4 question. All right. Cool. I'm happy to geek out of this if folks <laughs> have more questions. I don't know if you have dealt with this at all, but do you so? 
hypothetically, I am thinking through how I could reuse the way that you were doing uh, YouTube embeds mm -hmm. to handle, um, I guess, like uh, web forms that are built out of a, uh, like a marketing automation mm -hmm. system mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it's sort of like framed. Yeah, yeah. The exact same problem. I can't move tag twice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you, have you heard of that working? Is yeah, uh, so we did a, we did like a project. Or yeah. yeah, so we did a project. Um, I did it actually in UA, which was a huge pain in the butt. Um, and then due to business reasons, didn't have to do it in GA4. But I think it would work the same way. Uh, so what we did in UA was we uh, basically, the situation was we had a website that had the main UA property on it. And then there was a second uh, iframed microsite that was basically iframed in due to regulatory reasons. Um, and then we had to use GTM on both sides in a separate property on the uh, iframe side and some custom HTML code to pass stuff back and forth. But you should be able to just drop your, um, your, your, your other GTM property in the other, um, in the, in the, you know, the origin site, basically, if you've got access to it on that system, and then have the, your own data stream over there. Frankly, depending on how the host name resolves, you might even be able to do that uh, with a single GTM. Um, like I, you might even just be able to do that with a single GTM um, container and just have a host name lookup table. I think I would probably keep the GTM container separate just for sanity. Um, just because I, I think that it would, it, to me, it's easy enough to keep separate. Like, okay, I've got a lookup table for all my different main properties. But if I have two different properties for the same website in the same container, I think that would get really confusing and error prone. So I would probably do a separate container there. But I think that would work. It should. Shouldn't be any reason why I wouldn't. All right. Well, I think we are at time, so I'm going to hit the button again. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>